I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1022 and you will find Luke chapter 4. You'll be able to follow along. And as always, if you're in the room, then uh, take one of those Bibles with you. We want you to have a Bible, read the Bible, because we know that will change your life if you read and apply God's Word. Now, if uh, you're here at Sweetwater Campus, then grab one of those Bibles that's in the seats right there. If you're at Parker Campus, then uh, there's a table right behind you, uh, right there in the middle. Just get up and go and grab one of those Bibles, bring it back, and again, if you need one, take one. We want you to have it and read it. By the way, if you're joining us online, then, uh, and you would like a Bible as well, then please message us, contact us, let our service hosts know. We will get you a Bible, whether we mail that to you or deliver that to you, because we want everyone to read God's Word, apply God's Word, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, I need to begin with a disclaimer, uh, because I realize I'm wearing an Arizona Cardinals jersey. We're playing in the playoffs on Monday night, and, and I'm immediately following a song called Champion. <laughs> and, uh, and while I'm an optimist, I want that in no way to be construed as prophecy on my part. Uh, because uh, while I'm an optimist, I'm, I'm not uh, crazy. So, uh, hey, I, I, there's a chance, but I'm not going to guarantee anything. So, uh, that said, hey, I don't know if you guys heard all the announcements that are going on, all the things. That are, there's so many cool things you can sign up for, take with you when you leave this weekend. I, I certainly hope you heard the one about Faith and Grace Luncheon. And, and uh, I share that because I am a board member of Faith and Grace. I, I'm on their board. Uh, I want to see them succeed. They're the only domestic violence shelter in Lake Havasu City. Uh, and so if you uh, are free next Sunday afternoon, 1230 over at McCulloch, then by all means, stop by the table, sign up on your way out. If you're joining us in Parker and you would like to attend, you're welcome. Just call our church office and we will put you on the list. We have limited seating. So uh, just know this, if you really want to see them succeed and thrive, and uh, you don't want to miss the banquet, so make sure you sign up. And uh, there's no cost for the meal, uh, but we're going to hit you up for money. So just know that. And uh, look, you guys know that. It's, it's just kind of obvious, right? It's a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So anyway, it, it is free, but uh, uh, you know what we're going to say. So anyway, I, I encourage you to be there. I encourage you to sign up. And would love to see you there next Sunday. So, uh, did you come tonight on accident or on purpose? Yeah, I don't think anybody accidentally showed up at the campus. I mean, you might have accidentally tuned in. You know, you're flipping through your YouTube channels and found us. But, uh, but uh, do you remember as a child having that argument with your siblings about whether something was done on accident or on purpose? Anybody else have those arguments? See, I had two older brothers. There was lots of accidentally on purpose stuff that happened. You guys know, you know what I mean? And, and you, you would accuse, you did that on purpose. No, I did it. It was an accident. So, for instance, uh, I got hit in the head playing basketball. That was probably an accident. I got hit in the head with a baseball while I'm mowing the yard. Probably not an accident, right? Now, they say, well, no, it was an accident because I meant to hit you in the back, not in the head. Right? I was playing football, one-on-one -on -one football with my older brother because I didn't have any sense as a child. And, uh, and he tackled me. I tried to stiff arm him. He tackled me, grabbed my arm, spun me up in the air, and slammed me face first into the ground. That was an accident because, you know, the game was over then, and he got in trouble for giving me a bloody nose. So, uh, you know, accidents happen. On the other hand, we're playing football in the backyard, and my oldest brother's window suddenly slides open, and he launches a homemade hand grenade at us. That's on purpose, right? We're all running for the trees like, incoming! And if you're wondering what a homemade hand grenade was, he just took, you know, a firecracker and wrapped some cement around it and, and, uh, and tossed that our way. So there was shrapnel involved. But uh, no, no one was, uh, some of you are like, I'm going to make one of those now. <laughs> Do not try this at home. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a good thing. So... That, that's all fun. We can all, we can all argue about whether this was on accident or on purpose, but let me ask you a question. Are you living an accidental life or a life that's on purpose? Luke chapter 4, very short passage, verse 42, and it says, And when it was day, Jesus departed and went into a desolate place. 
And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. You see, Jesus models a life of purpose. Jesus models a life of purpose. Uh, Luke chapter 4, if you look at the, the flow of this chapter, it starts off with Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and then he ends up in Nazareth at his hometown. And in his hometown, of course, uh, he's rejected. He's kicked out. They almost killed him. Uh, and then he goes to Capernaum and does this amazing work. I mean, he kind of hits a home run in Capernaum, and he just, you know, he's teaching, he's healing, and people are flocking to him, and there's crowds, and, uh, and suddenly he is wildly successful. And the people of Capernaum, they want Jesus to be their pastor. They want him to stay in Capernaum and preach and heal at his own megachurch right there. And Jesus walks away. How, I mean, how could he reject those people? They wanted him to stay. And the way that Jesus could walk away in that moment was that Jesus understood his purpose. Jesus understood his purpose. You guys are a couple of slides behind. But anyway, uh, verse 43, look at this again. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. I was sent for this purpose. Now, when we understand our purpose... It gives life clarity. Uh, you understand, if you know why God created you, if you understand what you are on this earth for, it gives life clarity. You, you, you understand the decisions that you need to make, the direction you need to go, the, the, the things that are before you, they all make sense when you understand your purpose. It allows us to make decisions based on our purpose, what God put us here for, rather than how we feel or what other people say we should do. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus understood his purpose. So when the crowds came to him and said, you need to stay, he said, nope, I've got something else to do. Here's what I need to do. In other words, Jesus led himself instead of following the crowd. Jesus led himself instead of following the crowd. I mean, think about it. The crowds came to Jesus and they pleaded for Jesus to stay. And, and come on, it's hard to turn down people who are asking for help, especially when you're the one who created them and, and you're here to save them. And, and, and they're letting you know how wonderful you are. And you can just do it here and we'll bring all the sick people to you. And we'll bring all the demon-possessed people here. And we'll bring all the crippled people to you. You can do it right here in Capernaum because we like you. And Jesus said, yeah, I know, but I've got something else to do. This purpose is for me to go and preach the gospel in these other places, in these other towns. Uh, and by the way, the people of Capernaum were being selfish. They wanted Jesus to stay with them. I, I've, I've thought about this, and I'm pretty sure I would have been with them. Right? I, I think I would have been with them going, come on, Jesus, stay. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? You're like, Jesus is there, and he, he comes and visits our church. What will we do? Stay with us. We know. We've got things to do, you know, but we want you here. We're selfish. But Jesus didn't follow the crowds. I mean, we see that throughout Scripture. The crowds wanted to make Jesus king. They wanted him to be a military Messiah. They kept asking him and wanting to do that. And Jesus didn't do it. He led himself based on his convictions and his calling. His convictions and his calling. He said, this is what I have to do. This is my purpose. This is what God has led me to do. This is what I'm going to do. So Jesus led himself instead of following the crowd. I'm just going to ask you this. Who is leading your life? Are you being led by your convictions or are you being led by the crowd? See, Jesus led himself because Jesus knew his ultimate purpose. Jesus' ultimate purpose was to save his people from their sins. I mean, that's what Jesus was all about. We know this because of the story of Jesus. I mean, Matthew chapter 1, uh, you know, Joseph, I don't know if you guys know the Christmas story or not. But Joseph is going to divorce Mary because she's pregnant and he knows he's not the dad. And before he can do that, an angel shows up. Gabriel shows up to Joseph and he says, Joseph, don't be afraid. Take Mary uh, as your wife because that which is conceived of her is born of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and so he does. And he says, you're going to name him Jesus 
because he will save his people from their sins. It's part of the prophecy about what he's going to do. And of course, if you listen to Jesus, you understand that he knew his ultimate purpose. In Luke chapter 19, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And of course, John 3, 16, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus knew that his ultimate purpose was to save his people from their sins. His ultimate purpose was to be the sacrifice for our sin, to ultimately defeat sin, death, and hell, and set us free to be the children of God and to live in freedom as servants of Christ. So has Jesus' purpose been realized in your life? When I say that, what Jesus' purpose is to save people from their sins. Has his purpose been realized in your life? In other words, have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? That heaven is your destiny and, and that nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Uh, do you know that? Okay, I can't hear you online, you know. See? Now, here's the thing. If you don't know that, if you're not sure that that you, at some point in your life, have confessed Jesus as Lord, you surrender your life to him, you've declared to the world that Jesus is your Savior in baptism, because that's obedience, then will you do that today? Will you do that right now? Just take a moment and, and just go, okay, Jesus, I, I've, I've been resisting this, I've been hanging on to control of my life, I haven't surrendered to you, and, and I'm going to call you Lord, and I'm going to follow you with my life from this point forward. Because that's the prayer of surrender. That's giving yourself to Jesus. And if you haven't done that, then we want you to do that right now. Whether you're in one of our campuses or whether you are in your house, uh, whether you're listening to this in your car driving down the road, we want you to surrender to Jesus because he's the only one who can forgive your sins. He's the only one who can set you free from death. He's the only one who can change your life. Now, if you're in the room and, and you did that today, you want to do that today, do, do one of three things. Grab a Connect card, fill it out. Drop it in one of the offering boxes. Just tell us that you trusted Christ. We'll talk to you this week. After the service, our prayer team is going to be here at the front. They would love to talk with you and pray with you about your decision to follow Jesus. Or find one of us pastors out in the foyer and just tell us, hey, today I made a decision to follow Jesus. Now, if you're joining us online, please message us. We want to have a conversation with you, follow up with you as well, because we want to help every single person follow Jesus. That's why Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, because I heard a lot of you say yes, I'm thankful for that. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, and you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, are you living on purpose? Are you living on purpose? Because in our culture today, a lot of people are living accidentally. And we can find ourselves living accidentally. You know, just kind of following the crowd, going this way and that, pursuing this then that, and never really living on purpose. Maybe our life got hijacked by addiction or just simply by being busy. And people ask you, How's life? And you go, it's busy. Not so sure that's what our goal in life should be. It doesn't matter if you're starting off in life or later in life. Everybody you talk to you, oh, I'm so busy. I've got small kids. I'm busy, busy, busy. Uh, you're retired. I'm so busy. I don't know how I had time to work. See, that, that's, that's not a purpose. Busy isn't a purpose. But our culture is overwhelmed by a lack of purpose. You know, purpose means you have a reason to live. You have a reason. And we know that our culture is awash in purposelessness because suicide is the number two killer of people under the age of 35. We have a crisis in our nation of people who are saying, hey, there's no reason to go on. And that doesn't even count the accidental overdoses that accompany that purposelessness. So maybe you find yourself living accidentally. Or maybe 
you know that you are one of those people who has a purpose. And you're focused on your purpose. And you're giving yourself to your purpose. And you're like, yes, I've got a purpose. It's to make money. Or it's to have a successful business. Or maybe it's to, you know, have some professional or educational accomplishments. Or maybe it's even your purpose is your family. And you're like, I'm going to have the best family ever. So if you're living on purpose, is your purpose godly? Is your purpose godly? Now you go, I didn't think about that. Well, we're following Jesus, and if we're living on purpose, then our purpose needs to be connected to and submitted to the purpose of Jesus. Let me say that again. If, if you're living on purpose and you're following Jesus, then your purpose needs to be connected to and submitted to Jesus' purpose. Okay, that's, that's how this works. So if, if your life is kind of purpose-driven, then our tendency is to focus on, you know, doing great things or, you know, having significance in this world. I want to make an impact in this world. I mean, we want to accomplish great things. We want to build an amazing business. We want to have a successful career. We want to be recognized and applauded. We want to be successful financially. We want to have an amazing family. Or maybe even we just want to build the best church in the history of the world. See, none of you really got that. Okay. But see, here's the thing. We often spend tremendous time, energy, and effort to achieve our purpose. We, we spend our energy on our purpose. And, and, and it leaves us wanting more. Let me just say it again. You can have all this purpose, and you can have this energy, and you say, I'm going to accomplish this. But if you accomplish it, it's not going to satisfy you. Accomplishing your purpose isn't going to satisfy you. Because of this reality, our purpose is not to achieve greatness, but to live godliness. Our purpose isn't to do great things, but to live in a godly way that honors Jesus. So if you can't identify your purpose, can, can I just tell you that uh, we're going to help you identify purpose in just a moment. So if you kind of go, wow, I've been living accidentally and I don't know what to say right now because I feel kind of convicted that I don't have a purpose, then uh, hang on just a moment. And if you've been living on purpose, if you've like, I'm laser focused on my purpose, I know what I'm doing, um, then please hear this. Our purpose is not to achieve greatness, but to live godliness because followers of Jesus represent who? Okay, front row got it. Followers of Jesus represent who? <laughs> guys are like, I don't know whether I should say this out loud or not. I'm going to follow a Jesus, but I'm kind of embarrassed by that. No. Look, if we're followers of Jesus, we represent. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how this gig works. You know, you identify yourself as belonging to Jesus. You're going to follow Jesus. You're a child of God because of Jesus. You're going to heaven because of Jesus. He's kind of a big deal. And so here's the thing. We can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And it doesn't matter how great your achievements are unless you are living a godly life. I mean, the Apostle Paul called us ambassadors of Christ. He said, hey, you are the ones representing Jesus to a world that doesn't know Jesus so that people will want to follow Jesus with their lives and experience the life-changing grace and power that you've experienced. That's the way this works. So when we understand our purpose is to represent Jesus in every aspect of life, then we represent Jesus while we're building a business, while we're pursuing a career, while we're building a financial por portfolio, while we're attending school, or while we're building a church. And we can even represent Jesus when we're receiving recognition if we understand that our purpose is not to achieve greatness, but to live godliness. You see, if our purpose is to honor Jesus in all things, then everything we accomplish will reflect Jesus. I mean, if you're a doctor, then you'll heal people in the name of Jesus. If you're a businessman, you will offer customer service to people as if they were Jesus. If you're a teacher, then you will teach reflecting your commitment to Jesus. You may not be able to explain the Jesus story in your classroom, you may not be able to teach the Bible in your classroom, but you'll still be able to represent Jesus. If you're a mechanic, then you can fix cars to the glory of Jesus. 
You see, that, that's how this works. So let's talk about what a life of godly purpose looks like. Because some of you are still going, okay, uh, I, I get that, but what does that mean? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for, for us? How do, we, how do we, you know, apply this? It, it's simple in words. It's going to be really challenging to live. But I'm just going to tell you, you can live this purpose of godliness in the midst of building a business career, a family, retirement, all of this. You, you take these principles and you apply them to your path, your life, your experiences, your, the people around you. So here we go. It, the, there's four statements. I don't know if there's uh, the, uh, in your notes if these will make sense. But four statements, two word statements that I want you to hear. This, this is true for all of us in the kingdom of God. Our purpose is to worship God, love family, bless people, proclaim Jesus. Worship God, love family, bless people, proclaim Jesus. Okay, imagine if there were periods where God's supposed to be capitalized uh, on the screen. So uh, let me break this down just a little bit. Worship God. Okay, Jesus said, the great commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, Everything you do is supposed to be focused on God, loving God, serving God, worshiping God. He's our everything. If we're going to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that means that's what worship looks like. It means the focus of life is God. Think about it. Jesus is being tempted. This is still in Luke chapter 4, and, and Satan wants him to bow down and worship him. What does Jesus say? You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's only one person to worship, and that's God. There's only one person to serve with your life. That's God. And, and, and so God is your king. He's your provider. He's your savior. He's your redeemer. So worshiping God means that God is the priority in your life. Worship God. Now, by the way, can I just tell you, if, if you're here at our Sweetwater campus or our Parker campus, I love the fact that you are in the room. Thank you for choosing right now on purpose to worship God. If you're joining us online, thank you for tuning in and choosing right now, wherever you are, to worship God. I applaud that. I commend that. But I have to ask, is worship a priority in your life or a convenience in your life? Because if we're going to, you know, live on purpose, that means we need to worship God. And we need to love family. Love family. This ought to put a smile on your face because a lot of people go, yeah, family. You guys realize that family is the first unit of structure that God created in this world, right? First, first thing he created, family. It's not good that the man should be alone, so he made a woman. And, and Adam went crazy and said, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Thank you, God, for finally getting around to creating this for me. And, uh, and see, family is created to bless us and allow us to bless others. If you're reading along with us in the Old Testament right now, reading through the Bible in the year, you're, you're reading stuff about family. They were all messed up families, but, but God redeems that and, and uses that. It's all about family. And family and marriage is used to describe God's relationship with us, right? When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, when you pray, say, our, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father, he said, look, address God in that family relationship. He's your father, his, your heavenly father. And then, of course, the church is described in the New Testament as the bride of Jesus. When, when the Israelites were unfaithful, and, and in a sense, when we're unfaithful in, in worshiping other gods, then God actually called that adultery. You're spiritually unfaithful to me like a wife being unfaithful to her husband. And then, of course, when we confess Jesus, we become children of God. John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received Jesus, even to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God, which is why we encouraged you to confess Jesus earlier on, because we want you to be a child of God and be part of this family. So love your family. Protect them. Provide for them. Nurture them. Teach them. Hey, if you're in the room and you're kind of young, you still got kids at home, can I just encourage you to, to love your family? Pour yourself into your marriage. You know, date your spouse. G give uh, your spouse your time and your energy. Pray for your spouse on a regular basis. Get counseling before your marriage gets to a crisis point, if you need it. 
Invest in your kids. Spend time with your children. Teach them your values. Worship together. It's life-changing. And you'll never regret it. You know, having been pastor here for almost 30 years, uh, I've been with a lot of people toward the end of their life. Not one person has said, you know what I really regret is not spending more time at the office. I really regret not, uh, not playing another round of golf. I really regret not taking another fun trip. No, they, they, the, the thing they regret is fa- missing out family. Nobody ever grieves the fact that they can't go back to work. They grieve the fact that they can't be there for their family. Understand the significance. Understand the purpose that God has built into us. So if you're young, do that. By the way, if you're older, can I encourage you to invest in your marriage? Date your spouse? Get counseling before your marriage gets to crisis? Invest in your children and your grandchildren. Enjoy them. Encourage them. And if you're older and your priorities were off when you were younger, can I encourage you to repent and apologize? Yeah, repent and apologize. If you know that you weren't the dad or mom that you, you should have been, that God, uh, you know, would have had you been, that you, that's a point, of, a point of regret in your life, then make a phone call or send an email or sit down face-to-face and say, hey, I'm sorry, I blew it. You know, Jesus is really important to me now, and I wish I'd, I'd had that con- conviction when you were young and had led you differently. If you blow it in some other way, apologize for that. It'll be healing for you, and it'll be healing for them. And maybe, just maybe, you'll uh, see life change happen out of that. Because our God is the God of redemption and reconciliation. So worship God, love your family, bless people, bless people. After all, Jesus said, you know, the first and great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Guess what the second one is? Love your neighbor as as yourself. So, uh, I don't know about you guys. I like to be blessed. Anybody like to be blessed? Okay, then bless people. It's, It's part of your purpose, which means that you are kind and patient with everyone you meet, even while driving. See, some of you are like, I gotta repent. Uh, Before I get in the car, especially in the parking lot at church when we're leaving. See, look for ways to help people and encourage people. The people that God puts in your path, bless them. I mean, and and look, you have multitude of opportunities every single day to bless people. Do it. The wait staff that's going to take care of you when you go to dinner uh, or lunch. Look, you know, go ahead and bless them. The, The people who work in the doctor's office, bless them. I know you don't feel good. That's why you're there. Go ahead and bless them. I know you're late. They're making you wait for your appointment. Bless them anyway. You know, the clerks in the grocery store, it's not your fault you got in the slow line anyway. It's not their fault. It's yours. Um, Bless them. Hey, wait, how about this? Really freak people out. Bless the people who are working at the DMV. Okay? Oh, you're like, oh, even them? Yes, even them. See, the Apostle Paul said, encourage one another and build one uh, one another up. You have power to bless. Stop wasting it and start using it. Every single day, it's part of your purpose. And then, of course, proclaim Jesus. So you're going to worship God, love family, bless people, and proclaim Jesus. Jesus' purpose was to save people, and our purpose involves helping Jesus accomplish his purpose. It's kind of a privilege thing. So we get to help people meet Jesus. And, and, uh, and we do it. In, in, in all kinds of ways. We do it by serving. You know, radical service is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that, that uh, the love of Jesus is best demonstrated by service and acts of kindness to others. Yeah, I mean, we really believe that, which is why you can, you know, walk out of here and sign up for Evening of Hope and serve some of the, you know, uh, least of these in our community. You can walk out of here and sign up for Faith and Grace and you can serve people who've been beaten down by life and unfortunately by their spouse. It's why we have teacher appreciation coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's why we have serve our schools coming up. We we want you to serve, so take advantage of that and serve people. It makes a difference. So you can proclaim Jesus by serving. You can proclaim Jesus by giving. Can I just commend you for the generosity and faithfulness that Calvary has towards giving? I, I mean, there are opportunities that we have to bless because of you guys' blessing. So I, I praise God for that. But can I just also mention that there are opportunities for giving, significant giving beyond the tithe, beyond just the the obvious ways. Uh, 
look, God blessed us with a campus in Parker. Isn't that cool, Parker campus? God blessed us with a campus. But uh, it needs a lot of work. So about a half million dollars, uh, we're going to invest in that to, to bring it up to speed. So can I just encourage you to give? And by the way, if you want to write the check for the whole amount, that's a five with five zeros after it before the decimal point. You know, and by the way, there's going to be other campuses soon, so uh, th this is not going to be the one, one and done kind of thing. And, and then there's still $2 million of debt on the Sweetwater campus. You know, we want to pay that off because we need to build more here for the children and the teenagers and, and all the things that are going on during the week. And by the way, that's a two with six zeros before the decimal point if you want to write that check. And, 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 and okay, and this is on my heart, and, and uh, it's on Pastor Chet's heart. We've been talking about it for a while. Because together we've served Calvary for 47 years. Um, we would like to see a Calvary foundation. You know, where people can invest and where there are resources that go for generations to come or, or until Jesus comes, whichever happens first. But I won't be around to see it. But I want to see people blessed down the road. And if that's something that you're interested in, please see one of us or make an appointment to sit down with us. Because we'd love to talk about that and explore what God could do. And, of course, we proclaim, not just by serving and giving, but by inviting. Your unchurched friends and family are waiting to be invited. I, I say that because statistics continue to say that 80% of unchurched people say they would go to church if invited by a friend or a family member to attend with them. Now, here's what my strategy is. I don't know if those statistics are accurate, but why don't we test it out and see? Why don't we ask our unchurched friends, our unchurched family, if they will come to church with us and see if they say yes. You go, well, they would never say yes. You don't know if you don't ask them. So I dare you to ask them and then come and tell me. Well, they said no. Or maybe they said not now, but they'll do it later. Or maybe they said yes and they came. Wouldn't that be cool? Because that's part of our purpose is leading people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So do you really want to live on purpose? Do you really want to live on purpose? Okay, then decide that whatever you do, wherever you go, you're going to worship God, you're going to love family, you're going to bless people, and you're going to proclaim Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you because it was your purpose to save us from our sins, and you did that by sacrificing Jesus on the cross for us. And through his shed blood, through his broken body, we have forgiveness, we have life, we have hope, we're adopted into your family, we become new creations, and, and we get to live with a purpose in this world, a purpose that is not self-centered or self-consumed. So God, meet us right now, whether we're worshiping at home or in the room and transform us so that we can be people of purpose, godly purpose, a purpose that makes a difference in the lives of those we love most dearly and the lives of those that we don't even know. God, we can't do this without you. So we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.